Good morning, Church for the City. How are you guys doing today? Let's all stand, get our excitement going. My name's Denise, and I'm excited to be here today because it's my favorite place to be on a Sunday. I hope you all are as well. I just want to welcome you to Church for the City. If you're here in the building, we're so glad that you're here. And if you're watching with us online, we're so thankful that you can join us no matter where you are and thankful for all the great technology, right? If it's your first time today, please text the word guest to the number on the screen. We would love to connect with you, answer any questions that you might have. And if you're watching online, you can do the same thing as well. And we're going to open up with scripture this morning. We're going to read Luke chapter 1, verse 46 to 47. It says, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. I love this verse. It, the first part says, How my soul praises the Lord. God created us to worship Him and to praise Him. And our soul is everything that we are. It's our mind, our will, our emotions. So that's what we need to do today. Praise the Lord with all of our soul, with all that we are. And the second part says, how my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. We should be rejoicing every day that we have a Savior, that God is our Savior. Amen? So as we worship today, as we praise the Lord, let's do it with all that we are. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for this day, for this morning. I thank you that we can be here in the house of God. We can be here together with our brothers and sisters to praise you and to worship you, Jesus. We thank you for who you are. We thank you that you have miracles in store for us. We thank you that your presence is with us, Lord. And we pray for our pastor this morning that you would be with him as he preaches your word, God. We love you. We thank you. We give this service to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. In heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing.
Come on, can we rejoice today? Come on, our Savior has come. Oh, we rejoice, Lord. Well, church, every week we also rejoice because someone goes public with their faith. So let's turn our attention to the screen and celebrate this together. Come on. Andy, and I am eight years old, and I am ready to be baptized. One night, me and my mom were talking about the Lamb's Book of Life. I believed in my heart Jesus was calling me by name. I asked Jesus to forgive me of my sins and gave my life to him. Since giving my life to Jesus, he makes me brave, and I am ready to do all that he has for me for the rest of my life. Today I'm going public with my faith. Dandy, Jesus said every disciple should be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And because of your confession of faith, today I baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And according to scripture, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit.
celebrate this morning. Born that man no longer may die. Thank you, Jesus. Can you lift your hands with me? We're going to worship and sing about the Holy Spirit today. We worship you.
Called minute to mingle, say hi to them, tell them you're glad they're here this morning. Well, all right, good morning to you, and welcome to Church for the City. We're so glad that you're here uh, in the house uh, with us. Let's just give our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ an applause for his presence being in the house. Uh, also, we want to greet the online campus. We thank you for joining with us. Let's celebrate them. A couple of things I want to go over before I dive uh, into the word on your seats. Uh, you should have an invite card. This invite card is for you to uh, invite someone to the upcoming services. <clears throat> we'll start next week uh, with our Getting Ready for Jesus series, which will take us through uh, the, the services on Christmas Eve. Uh, and as, as you know, of course, next Sunday is normal, 9 to, 9 to 11. Also on Christmas Eve, as you've noted on the card, will be a, a regular Sunday morning service because it is Sunday. 
And so that would be 9-11. And then the evening services are 5 uh, and 6.30 p.m. Uh, on Christmas Eve. So just to remind you, those are two different service types. The 9 and 11 a.m. on Christmas uh, Eve morning is just Sunday morning services, and then we ask you to join with us in one of our Christmas Eve uh, services also. Always a great opportunity to invite family, friends, <clears throat> maybe people who don't normally join you at service may be more open to you uh, bringing them to those services. Now, even though the Sunday morning, 9 and 11, will be a normal, what I would say normal service, I don't know if I should use that term, but you get the point, uh, those services will only be one hour. So all four services on Christmas Eve will be scheduled around one, uh, one hour services. And then on the back side, you have uh, the invite for church at home. Uh, on the 31st, uh, we will be... Uh, here at the church, or we, we sending out the message here from the uh, from the church, but uh, we won't be gathering in the building. That will be church uh, at home on the on the 31st, and those services will also be uh, regular times, 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. So you want to use these cards to invite someone. They're good reminders for you, but more so to invite somebody to be with you uh, at the house of the Lord. Uh, also, this Sunday uh, we're concluding our heart. Uh, for the city series. Uh, we usually let you know what we're doing for next year. Uh, the big things for us is the uh, getting into all of the Arizona uh, state prison systems, ministering to 50,000 uh, inmates, male and female. Uh, also the church plant uh, or campus actually in San Luis having a location there where we can meet uh, on a regular basis and be able to do worship. We're meeting at a location there now, but it's in the library. And uh, so you can imagine in the library, a little bit limited on how loud you can sing, what you can sing, how much. They don't charge us to be there in the library, and we're very grateful for that. But it's, it's a little bit more uh, stifled, if you know what I mean. And we got Pastor Abel Garcia leading there. And, uh, <laughs> you know, trying to, trying to put a, a muzzle on his volume uh, it's a little bit but uh, but they're growing uh, and we're just looking forward to having a place there and then also to begin the daycare and the preschool by the fall of 2024 those are the things that we're asking you to give to so every year on this particular Sunday usually first or second Sunday of December uh, we ask you and hopefully you still have your I noticed that there's no legacy cards on the chair hopefully you have they're gone so I'm gonna say they're gone because you got them that's a fair assumption good assumption say yeah pastor I got mine all right there we go there we go there we go so uh, so we're asking you today to make that commitment of what you will do for a year-end gift or as you note on there there's opportunities to make the commitment for the year-end and you can break that up uh, over the course of the year that helps us do those things that are, what, again, what I call the big rocks. Those are the major vision issues, and, uh, and all other giving goes to our outreach and, and our everyday uh, operation. There are some other things that's kind of uh, in the works that I'm very excited to uh, announce that might be getting established here real soon, but uh, can't yet. Uh, have to let my elders know and also... Uh, get it all done, but it's part of what we've been working on or had set out as a vision a couple of years ago that looks like all of that's coming into fruition uh, rather quickly. So I'm very excited to share that. But that's because of your giving. It's because of that year-end giving, that year-end commitment that you do that helps us. And those of you that tithe, those of you that give to CTC, it helps us do what we do and accomplish what we do uh, in our city. So thank you so much for that. At the end, at the end of the service, uh, there's going to be uh, people at each door, I believe, to collect the legacy commitment cards uh, on your way out. So thank you for your kindness, your generosity, and I'll talk a little bit about, more about generosity uh, in this message. All right, I'm going to pray, uh, and we're going to dive uh, right on into what the Word of the Lord uh, is saying. Let's go before Him. Father, I want to thank you for this opportunity to be gathered with your people in your house. We certainly do thank you for your love and your grace and your goodness to us. We, 
we know, Lord God, that we can't do anything without you. And uh, Lord, our heart's desire is that you will help us in the remainder of our time together as I communicate the word of the Lord. Uh, Lord, I thank you for the spirit of God being in the house. I thank you for, yeah, just the presence of you in community and in fellowship and the, and the joy that the people have in celebrating you and worshiping and, uh, and seeking you. May you be very, very personal and real to everyone that's here. I know, Lord God, when a message is preached that it cannot <clears throat> speak to every issue that someone may have on their heart and mind. But we know that you can. The Spirit of the Lord is able to get into the places of our life, our hearts, our minds, that maybe what's coming out of my mouth may not get there. But the Holy Spirit is able. So, Father, I pray that you indeed would work a deep work in the lives of those that are surrendered here today open to hear what you have to say to them. Lord, we do pray also for the land in, there in Gaza as the continued conflict. Some things, Lord, that now that are even affecting our own military troops that are in Iraq and Syria and other parts of the land, I pray, Father, for protection for them. That every one of them, Lord God, that are our sons, our daughters, our fathers, our mothers, our husbands, our wives, those that are serving for our country, that they will come home safe, accomplish the mission that they've been set out to do, protect that that they're to protect, and to come home safely. We pray, Lord God, for the Palestinians, Lord, those that are, that are certainly not part of Hamas, and those that are Palestinian Christians that have a heart to serve you in the land, Lord God, where they've been placed, we pray for their protection and the provision for them during this conflict. We pray for the release of the hostages, Lord God, that are kept. There's families, Lord God, that's getting news about lives of their loved ones that have been lost and taken. We pray, Lord God, for your comfort upon them. Pray your grace and strength upon the IDF, and the leadership of Israel as they make decisions that's wise and good. We pray for every local church, Lord God, in this city. As we approach the season that we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray that everyone that graces a pulpit in the local church, that they preach the gospel, they reflect upon Jesus, they give reasons on why we celebrate for this time. Lord, that it's a festive time, it's a time of enjoyment. I pray, Lord, that Christ will be exalted, people's lives transformed in this city that we live in, that we love, that the houses of worship would become fuller and fuller with people who want to know about Jesus. We pray for families, Lord God, in our, in our local church, that it would be a festive season, a joyful season, that each of us will be light in darkness. In a world of darkness, let us be light, light in how we live, light in the things that we do, light in reflecting Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord God, for any families that are grieving loss during this time or maybe reflecting upon a loss that they've had during the year that has the tendency to maybe to take away from some of the joy that they can have in celebrating during Christmas. Be a comfort to them. Be with them through this. And Lord, I pray that every day, Lord God, that we seek you in our times of devotion, our times of prayer, <clears throat> Every day, Lord God, we become more and more aware of your goodness. That you are a God who came in flesh to come to us in our sinful, wrecked condition. That you may show us a love that's so overwhelming and so amazing that all we can do is surrender to it and give you thanks each and every day. Father, we love you and we thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, I'm going to ask you to stand, and we're going to go to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 8. I'm going to just read verses 1 through 5 and dive into this message on generosity. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. 2 Corinthians in the New Testament. 
uh, after you get through the Gospels, then you got the great book of, of Acts, Romans, and then the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 8. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, <clears throat> begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. So far, the reading of the word. You, you can be seated. Now, just, just a little bit of background on uh, 2 Corinthians. Um, Paul is the writer here, the Apostle Paul. He's writing to a church in Corinth. Could be churches in Corinth, I should put it that way. Uh, churches in Corinth. And he's letting them know he's, he has, he's in various places, as, as you may know, starting churches, training, leadership, etc. What he's writing about here in chapter 8 and chapter 9, and the message won't be like a normal one. I'm, I'm going to go between chapter 8 and chapter 9, but not necessarily flow in chronological order. But he's writing about their generosity toward those that are in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was still the, the main center of Christianity, where the ministry was being done, the apostles was being sent out, the evangelists, and uh, et cetera, there, and also a lot being done in, in uh, Antioch. And he's writing to the people in Corinth, actually uh, sharing about the generosity of people in what would be considered Upper Macedonia. That would be uh, Thessaloniki, uh, Philippi, and Berea. Those of, those of you that are going to Greece with us will go to those cities. They're more of a poor community, uh, a poor region. But yet he's saying to them, even though there were poor people, they had a real heart for the things of the Lord, a real heart for the gospel being preached. And he's saying to the Corinthians that, you know, your generosity should also be reflected in the fact of what your heart is toward the gospel and what your heart is toward the work of the kingdom of God, as we see with those in uh, Macedonia. Now, uh, anytime you, first of all, here, as I shared last week, there's one time of the year that I'll give uh, sermons or discuss more so uh, generosity, and it's, it's, it's always this time of the year. It usually starts right around uh, Thanksgiving, and, and then I'll work right on until I get to the Christmas sermons. And th the whole idea, of course, is to reflect what the Bible teaches about it and how we should embrace it, what our thoughts should be, how we apply to it. There's usually, you'll usually find three categories of people. Some, uh, some, some people have the mindset that, uh, and I just heard this recently, not necessarily about our church, and I hope not, although every week certainly we talk about the opportunity to give, but we don't pass a plate. Uh, we just, as, as the Lord works up on people's heart, we just believe you'll, you'll give as a spirit guides. I've heard people say that, you know, you, you go to a church and all they talk about is money. I don't. I don't know about that, don't know. Uh, I've only been in one church for 30 years, so this is all I know, right? So I, I can't say about, about other churches, but I will tell you, uh, there's more about stewardship in the Bible than there is any other subject. And, and so it's not a matter, no matter uh, if you read the Gospels, if you read the Bible, uh, it's not that you're going to be able to get all through your Christian life and not hear about what the Bible says about what to do with money. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm of the thought and the mindset, and hope you are too, anything the Bible has to teach, I want to know about it. Anything the Bible teaches, I want to know about it. There's not one area of your life that the Bible doesn't speak about. I mean not one area of your life that the Bible doesn't speak about. There's usually some generic approaches, though, 
uh, to the idea of possessions, what God gives us. There is the mindset, and even among some Christians, that everything I get is mine, and it belongs to me, and I can do whatever I want with it. I'm not going to go much into that because that's so unbiblical, it ain't even worth talking about. Uh, that definitely is not the mindset. You know as well as I do, nothing belongs to us, right? We do know that. Nothing belongs uh, to us. Now, let me, let me just share something with you. You don't need to be nervous, and, and honestly, uh, I got about eight pages of notes here. This can take about 70 minutes, or we can get right on through it pretty quickly with a few amens. Yes, sir. You got it, pastor. Thank you. I'm with you on this. We can get through it a little bit, a little bit quicker. You ain't got to be nervous. I'm just going to tell you what the Bible says, and uh, we're going to skip the loo right on to where you're going, my darling. All right. So, there's no, there's no reason to deal with that issue because nothing belongs to us. This, this, our Lord and Savior is the owner of us and everything we got. And so the best way to know how to deal with that is to know what God says about it. So the mind said that it's mine and I can do whatever I want with it, that, 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 that's, a, that's a scratch. And then there's the, uh, those who understand that the, that the Scripture teaches uh, about the 10%. It actually teaches about more than that. I'll share a little bit about that, but where, it, where it's the distinction between the Old Testament and New Testament. But, uh, but there's many Christians that know, hey, we're asked to give 10% of our income, and so that's what, we, that's what we do, and then everything else we do what we want with. And then there's those, though, who have the mindset that, um, that everything that, that they get, all their possessions are for absolutely for the gospel uh, and for the poor and the lost. None of those thoughts are, are biblical, uh, but, there, but there's some prominent people who do. Some of you may have heard the name John Wesley. John Wesley was a great evangelist, uh, foundation of the, of the Methodist church, foundation of a lot of revivals uh, in the 1800s. At the time, John Wesley's income was like 160000 compared to today, what that would be today. But he, he gave away 140000 of it, only lived on 20000 And uh, he got to the point as he got older, any orphans that he had on the walls or on any mantle at his home, he would turn those over because he felt like he wasn't able to do enough to reach everybody that he wanted to reach. And that was his mindset, <laughs> that everything I do and get, <clears throat> I need a little bit to live, the rest goes to the gospel. Uh, one, of, one of my favorite movies to watch, and it's not necessarily about the gospel, but it's Schindler's List. It's about 30 years old. It's an excellent movie. And, and if, if you've seen Schindler's uh, List, Oscar Schindler went to uh, Poland with the idea of uh, being an entrepreneur and make lots of money in business. And while he was there, he saw that a lot of the Jewish people were being either killed or tortured. He hadn't seen it with his own eyes yet, but he knew about it and uh, was convinced that he could bring in some of the Jewish people to work for him. Well, over a period of time, though, as the Nazi regime got stronger and stronger, they started obviously slaughtering the Jews. And there was a scene there, which I won't go into, in which he was really startled about what was happening, changed his whole mindset. Instead of being about making money in business, he was absolutely about saving the Jews. Saved over a thousand Jews. But the, the scene at the end is right when the end, he had lost everything, lost his business, lost his family. His whole mission was to save the Jewish people. But at the end, there's a scene where he realizes he still has his watch on. And he cries in agony because he said that watch could have saved two more Jewish people. That, that, that was the... The, the, the heart of him was that everything he got was to, to save others. Uh, J.D. Greer, in a publication I read, he talked about uh, in this how he struggled on how to know how to use what God has given and what his Christian life was like and, and you know, what to save, what to give, etc. And, and he defined this little thing that he came to, this conclusion, he called it the generosity matrix. And I actually like the idea of that. And uh, he shared in this publication some principles that he had, uh, that he had learned. I'm not going to uh, go with all of that or use all that, but there's certainly at least four principles that I, 
I think are absolutely biblical that I'd like to share with you, and then we'll bring uh, some application. Uh, because in a number of places in the Bible, the Scriptures is real clear to us, how do we use our possessions? What, what do we do with what God has given us? It takes wisdom. There's some times of tension uh, with that, which I may reveal and expose. But the idea is, if, if I want to be a, a, a follower of Jesus Christ, and when I say follower of Jesus Christ, I mean just that. If I'm going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, I want to know what Christ teaches or what the Word teaches about how I'm to follow Him in every area. So I'm going to just give you some, uh, some thoughts here that I think are, uh, are, are pretty clear. And I actually will start out with the easiest one, the easiest one to hear and the easiest one to accept and the easiest one to practice. And that's it. God gives you everything he gives you to enjoy it. I don't know why I didn't get more amens. I don't know. I'm starting out easy. Relax. Turn to your name and say, relax. It's going to be all right. Just relax. God gives you everything richly to enjoy. The, the, the mindset that people have that we're not supposed to have fun, that we're not supposed to enjoy what God gives us, is just absolutely bogus. God is a God of goodness. God is a God that wants us to enjoy the things that he gives us. 1 Timothy 6, 17 says this, tell those who have the riches of this world, listen to this, not to be arrogant and not to place their confidence in anything as uncertain as riches. Instead, they should place their confidence in God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy richly provides for us everything. So God is to be glorified in everything that he gives us. He, we're to enjoy good food, enjoy good feasts, enjoy great opportunities to celebrate life and enjoy people and enjoy the things that God gives us because he trusts us with those things. Jesus enjoyed so many feasts, they called that dude a glutton and a wine bibber. I mean, he, Jesus loved to eat. Jesus loved to go to parties. Uh, one, I'm doing a study on Luke for various messages during the year, actually some of them in a, in a few weeks. And one theologian I read, a guy last name Karras, it, it was startling when he said it. And then as I'm reading through the book, it was true. He says, you know, you look at Jesus in the book of Luke. He's either at a feast, he's either going to a feast, or he's leaving a feast. I mean, the whole book of Luke is Jesus about feasts, and I thought, man, that's why my, my lovely wife is a follower of Jesus. You know, <laughs> feasts coming and going, right? But, uh, but, but, but the, the, the truth of it is, God wants us to richly enjoy the things that he gives us. And, and beyond that, there is, there is no problem with, with, with enjoying a nice hotel and sitting on a nice beach. Nothing wrong with having a, a, a comfortable life and a spacious home with a well manicured lawn, nothing with wearing clothes that come straight off the runway from Paris. God gives us things to enjoy. Can you say amen to that? He gives us things to enjoy. All throughout the scriptures, you see so many people that was overwhelmed with the riches of God. They were generous, but overwhelmed with it from Abraham, Jacob, David, Solomon. Uh, even in Luke chapter 8, Jesus talked about when they were going out to do the gospel, when he released the apostles, they were asking him, well, how are we going to manage this? And he says, there's women among us who have wonderful businesses, and they're going to use their resources to help supply us uh, on this ministry. And so there's things for us to enjoy. It's a matter of learning how to keep that stuff in perspective. Philippians chapter 4, <clears throat> 12 and 13 says this, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Now, I know oftentimes we use that verse to say, you know, I can do all things because I got strength. It ain't got nothing to do with your physical strength. I know athletes paste it all on their arms and tattoo it on their back and plaster it on the walls. And it, it's good. It's it's, it's good. I mean, even as a coach, I'm sure I rallied with that verse every now and then. You know, you can do it. You can do all things in Christ. You know, you can do it. But, but that ain't what it's about. It's about can I in Christ live unto God when I got everything? Can I in Christ live unto God when I got nothing? 
He says, I can do all things in Christ. I know how to glorify him with much. I know how to glorify him with little. Pastor Larry Osborne said this. It actually cracked me up. He says, (laughs) when God Abrahams me, that means blesses me with prosperity, I'll give thanks and enjoy it. But when God jobs me, takes everything I got, I'll thank him and I'll enjoy my relationship with him. And that's, that's really the point of it, is, is that, that we can enjoy everything that God has given us to enjoy, but we got to know how to glorify him in all situations. And, and I don't know, you've probably been in situations like me where, you know, I'm sitting down at a place, I'm enjoying a, a good meal, and then a, a thought comes across my mind about some poor child who has nothing. And then you got to fight that guilt on your, you know, I'm sitting here and enjoying this ribeye, which I love me a good ribeye. And, uh, you know, and, and there's some poor child that uh, doesn't have uh, anything. And, and I, you know, my, my, my thought to that is, listen, not everything we do has got to be luxurious. You know, everything we do don't have to be gold. Copper works, too, sometimes, you know. And, and so, uh, but, but remember this, Jesus never taught us how to look through the lens of scarcity. As if because God is blessing me, he's ripping off somebody else. We, we never look through the lens of scarcity. We look through the lens of abundance. The same God that's able to bless me is the same God that promised to take care of the poor and the needy. Am I talking to the, to the right church? And, and so think, don't ever think that what God has given you is all he's got. He's got a whole lot more given good and to give goodly. That's a great sentence, actually. I hope I can remember that again. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's got a whole lot more. So don't think everything that needs to be done in this world depends upon you. Can you say amen to that? And so, so God gives us stuff to enjoy. That, that's just one principle. Now, that's not the only principle I want you to get, because if you live just on that principle, then you'll live a life of indulgence and miss, miss the point. Here's the second one. God gives excess to share with others. God gives excess to share with others. Just, that's just a biblical principle. We see it out through. In, in the Old Testament, uh, some of you farmers may, uh, may know this, and thank God we're in a good community of farmers who, who have a real heart uh, for generosity and giving. But in the Old Testament, the Lord commanded those that was in the agricultural community, you, you, you harvest your fields, but you leave stuff on the outside so that the poor people can go and get whatever they can, whatever they can get. That was a command. They were to leave so the gleanings of the, uh, of the poor. Now, they couldn't feed all the poor folks, but those that could get to their land, they had a, an area that they had set aside. Uh, in, 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 in the New Testament, it, it's amazing. I, I was on, on our way to Vegas the other day. I was reading my Bible, and I ran across a verse. I know I've read it. I don't know how many times, but for the first time, it struck me the way that it did. And it's in Ephesians 4.28. It says this, if you are a thief, quit stealing. Now, that, that was, that, that one, no, that, that ain't the one. I got, I know that one, right? That ain't what struck me. If you are a thief, quit stealing. It's, it said, instead, use your hands for good hard work and watch, and then give generously to others in need. Listen to what the heart of the New Testament is to people that are stealing. Stop stealing. Why should I stop stealing? Well, because you should stop stealing and you should work, but you should stop stealing so you can work and give to others. It was like, wow, that, what, a, what a concept. Even for a person who should stop doing something they should stop, the Bible says, why should you do it? So you should do some things that you can help other people. Isn't that, isn't that good? I, I thought that was good. I, I like the Bible. So here, here, here's, here's another one, 2 Corinthians 8, 12 through 15. It says, whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly. And give according to what you have, not what you don't have. Of course, I don't mean your giving should make life easy for others and hard for yourselves. Great principle. Don't give yourself out so much to you you starving. You gave away your refrigerator, and then you go home, and the children say, Daddy, where are we going to put the milk? Oh, don't worry about it. we just giving to others. No, no, you know, don't make it hard on yourselves. I only mean that there should be some equality. Right now, you have plenty and can help those who are in need. Later, 
they will have plenty and can share with you when you need it. In this way, things will be equal. As the scripture says, those who gathered a lot had nothing left over, and those who gathered only a little had enough. And so that's a principle out of Exodus chapter 16, when they were in the wilderness. The, 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 the teaching here, of course, is you, you got extra, you, you give, you share, you find ways to do it. Other people, ministries, agencies, obviously churches, uh, et, et cetera. You, you give to, to minister to those, help those, and accomplish things that you can't do alone. But he's telling us the reason you can do this is because of what he did in Exodus 16 with the, with the, with the manna. And, and you know it during the wilderness journey, every morning there would be fresh manna that would come down from heaven. Fresh manna. I mean, every morning, the Lord, I mean, it, it, was, it would be honestly like waking up every morning and there's stand burritos covered all over the ground every morning. Every morning you wake up and, man, there's a Stan's burrito. Every single day, a sign out there, fresh, hot now, Stan's burritos. Every morning, lay it out there. Now, what he told them not to do was to stockpile it. Go out there and get you a burrito. But don't go carrying your chest and getting 15 because you're thinking, man, I don't know. I mean, these burritos could stop it any day. We need to make sure we got some burritos for the next few days. He said, no, don't do that. I'm going to give you plenty, and I'm going to make sure that you have plenty also so that no one is lacking, but trust me that I'm going to make sure you have enough. You never have to be worried. And so, now, I, I, I mean, listen, I, I get it. If I was living during that time, I'm sure there would be days I would be tempted to think, you know, this could end any day. You know how the stock market is. God may be basing his things on the stock market. His resources get low, burritos gone. You know, you know we better hold on to something. But that's not, that's not the way. He says, listen, God gives us plenty of excess even in the present. He gives us plenty of what's in, uh, in front of us. And, you know, it's, you know, I, 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 thought, I thought about this. Um, it, it would be like if you, if you, I don't know how, if you still pack your kids' lunch for school and you know there's a, there's a, there's a child there that doesn't have lunch every day and your, and your child told him about it. So this particular day you put two sandwiches in his, in his lunch box, but you didn't tell him why. He's got the two sandwiches. He goes to school. You remember, oh, shoot, I didn't tell him why I put those two sandwiches in there. You rush down to the school. You run into the cafeteria. I got to give a message to my kid. And when you get there, you see your child giving a sandwich to somebody else. You didn't tell him. You didn't have to because he learned the heart of generosity. Now, if, he'd, if, 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 you'd, have walked, if you'd have walked to the school and, and you saw the fellow open up his lunchbox and he had, that one, he had two sandwiches, and he had the one, had the other, and didn't know what to do with it. And he ran somewhere and hid it because he would think that he wasn't going to get another sandwich. You as a parent would say, I'm your father. I'm your mother. You don't think I'm going to give you what you need every single day. You take what's extra and you give to others. That's kind of the heart of God toward us. Everybody follow me on this. That's kind of the heart of God on us. He will absolutely make sure that we have what we need. So you never got to worry about hoarding the surplus. God has a place for it that's going to bless somebody else. Can you say amen? So many places in the scripture, uh, it, 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 it talks about our responsibility to others. And, and there's so many verses there in the Proverbs about not withholding good and don't close your eyes to the poor. And James, in, in the book of James, talks about making sure we help uh, others in need and et cetera. We can go on and on and on. But just know this, God gives us what he gives us for the present. The present to, su to supply our needs and the present to be able to do things for others. Again, agencies, ministries, whatever the case uh, may be. And so when, whenever, obviously, whenever you hear about needs, the heart of us always should be, Lord, what do I do with what I got? Who do I help? Where do I give? What do I do? And, and that's the heart of it when the Lord gives us Gen, uh, uh, overwhelms us with generosity. Now, the third thing is, it's always wise to save. Always wise to save. Proverbs talks about that so much. 
you know, that the, the plans of the diligent will lead to abundance. It says, honor the Lord. This is Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. This won't be on the screen, I don't think. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Well, for you Pentecostals, bursting with sweet tea. But yeah, but, but you, you honor the Lord. You honor the Lord first. Uh, Proverbs 6, uh, go to the ant. See how she considers her ways, prepares in the summer, and then stores away uh, during the time of harvest. So it, it, God always thinks it's wise to save uh, and invest. And, and, and that, that's just pure biblical economics. We can go through so many verses uh, where the Lord does illustrations with parables, uh, etc. I like what Einstein said. Einstein was once asked, what's the most powerful force in the universe? And he said, compound interest. I like that. So right uh, and so true. So even that, though, you got you to gotta balance that out. You know, saving is wise. Investing is wise. But again, what is the Lord saying about what I have and how that can help other uh, causes? Now, people often ask me, you know, what, what do I do about generosity if I'm in debt? And it's a good question. And, and I, would, I would say, you know, I've had people say, I don't think it's good for me to, to try to be generous when I got debt to pay off. Well, the, the short answer for me is yes and no. Yes, uh, on the one hand, you, you, you certainly want to get out of debt with high interest loans, whether it be credit card debt, car loans, stuff that's unsecure, uh, et cetera, mortgages, anything that I think uh, is, it, that you can liquidate. And hopefully you got financial advisors, so... I'm not trying to put, take off the preacher hat and put on the financial advisor hat, but I do know some stuff, so I'm just going to throw that at you. Any, any, anything, my, my way of looking at it, if I cannot liquidate and, and sell everything and be perfectly fine, then something, some debt's got to gotta, gotta go. So the, so the idea, honestly, anything high interest and all of that, you need to get rid of it. Get, it, get out of debt as quickly as you can and uh, use more for the kingdom of God. But even in debt, there's still a heart of generosity. Are y'all hearing me? You can still be generous and be in debt. There, there, there would never be a time in my life when I would stop tithing, never. I, I don't care if I got to the point to all I made was $1,000 a month. $100 of it is going to the kingdom of God. There will never be a time when I would stop tithing. That belongs to the Lord. And I've learned over and over again, I do so much better with the 90% that God allows me to hear him to do on what I'm to do than me trying to rob him and say, man, I got to hold on to everything I get. Am I talking to the right church? Y'all doing all right? And so there's never a time where, where, where you can't be generous. Actually, that was a whole heart of what Paul uh, was dealing with here in 2 Corinthians 8. Uh, because, because the folks in uh, Thessalonica and, and Philippi and Berea were in some dire straits. But yet they, their heart, even in that, was to be generous because they knew that the Lord would bless them if they do what is right to the kingdom of God. Here's, here's the last uh, principle. And that is Jesus pointed to and proved a model of generosity. I don't even know if that's a principle, more of a statement. He, he, he pointed to and he proved the model of generosity. You, you, you might remember the scene in Luke 21 when Jesus was with the disciples. And he said in, in, uh, in Luke 21, 4, while Jesus was in the temple, he watched the, the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box. Then a poor widow came by and dropped in two small coins. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them. For they have given a tiny part of their surplus but she, poor as she is, has given everything she has. Now, Jesus is not saying that the woman has given away all of her livelihood. What Jesus is saying is that she trusts unto the kingdom of God, giving out of her heart of generosity, that everything she is all about is given unto the Lord. And, and he, make, he proves that point, that the model of generosity actually begins when we trust God in and for all things. And the reason that we follow Jesus is because that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus absolutely trusted all of his life in the hands of the Father that we may have eternal life. 
He didn't reserve anything. When Jesus died on that cross, he didn't just tithe 10% of his blood. He gave it all. When Jesus gave himself as a sacrifice, he didn't say, man, y'all can beat me on my, on my back, man, but don't touch none of the rest of my body. He gave it all. All of his body was broken. All of his blood was shed. Here is the richest, sinless person on the almighty God up on high who gave his all to us poor people that us poor people can be rich in eternity. It's the model of generosity that we get with Jesus. So that's, uh, that's the principles. I'm, I'm going to give a little bit, just a little bit of apl- application. Uh, it's still early yet. Y'all doing pretty good. Y'all following along pretty good. You all right? Give me about 10 more minutes or so. Team, y'all can relax. No more smoking. Just stay right there. Uh, just relax. So let me just give you, let me just give you some, some, uh, just, just some points of application. And, and these you can, I think, embrace. Here it is. Look to God, not money, as your primary source of security and significance. Real simple point. Just, just look to God. Not, not, not money as your source of security and, and, and significance. We, we always put God first. We always put God first. It's in God that we find security and significance. If you ever think the money you have is what's going to keep you secure. Now, now y- y- y'all been living long enough in this economy to know ain't nothing certain. This stuff can flip and dip and dive overnight, you know? And so you you certainly can't put your security and significance in what you have. You thank God for what you have and you glorify God in what you have, but you know that you have, have to find your security and your significance in God. And that's why it's easy to live this life with your hands wide open because you're not holding on to, this is my security, this is my significance, I can't do this, I can't give this, I can't do that. Like you're holding on to it like it's almighty God. No, 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 you can live with your hands wide open because you know your significance and security comes from him. It's all in him, from him, unto unto you. And so you, you don't put your confidence in what God has given you. You use it to glorify God. Use it to be a blessing, but your security and significance come from him. Second thing is, and I'll hit this one real fast, treasures are better in heaven than they are on earth. Everything we got here on earth is going to spoil. It's going to go away. I, I, there's no car that's going to last forever. I did see this guy. I almost called him a, a different kind of name. I saw this guy that's been working on his body to trying to make himself, maybe y'all saw this, to live forever. I, I just, I, I wish somebody would sit down with him with a Bible and say, how foolish are you? You're spending millions of dollars to try to find a way that you can live forever. Of course, that conversation would go further. Like, what are you afraid of? You afraid of dying? Now, why are you afraid of dying? Because if dying from this earth means absolute eternal life in the presence of the Almighty God, why would you try to spare yourself on this side? when you can live with him forever. So what is the real fear here? Do you feel like the world won't make it without you? Nobody even knows your name. We'll be fine without you. But it's, 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 it's the idea that oftentimes we think the treasures we need to build are here on earth. And the scripture says don't, uh, don't do that. Don't, don't store up treasures yourself here on earth. Moth and, and rust, it's gonna, it's gonna destroy it. Currency will soon be uh, be worthless. And, and so you learn to trade it. How do, you, how do you trade it? Then you use what you have here on earth for eternal stuff. Let me just tell y'all something as a church. Some of you, are, there are people that are saved in other parts of the world that you will never meet because you trade it. You traded your treasure here on earth, gave to the kingdom of God so a church can be planted in South Africa that's reaching people around the world. That's trading what I got here on earth that's going to come to rust by giving it to the kingdom of God so that what I am giving will last for eternity. When you get to heaven, there's going to be some African folks that hug you and say, I'm so grateful for what you've done for me. (laughs) You ain't never met them. You don't know them. But because of what you've done, there's going to be some folks in Venezuela speaking Spanish to you, telling you thank you for what you've done. 
There's going to be some, some pastors in China who was trained underground because of your giving that's going to come up and hug you and say thank you for what you have done. That's trading what you have here on earth for things that don't rust in heaven. Y'all doing all right? And here's the last thing. Team, you can come. Is follow the Spirit. Just follow the Spirit. He'll guide you. The Holy Spirit will guide us as individuals in what our role should be, what we should give. Do you even know the things that's on our heart here at CTC? How, how at the end of the year when you're doing all your other giving and give, gifting and buying and giving? I, I, I tell you, I used to, I used to, there was a period in my life when I, everything I heard, I thought, man, I'm supposed to do something about it. I'm supposed to do more for missions. I'm supposed to try to help more orphanages. I'm supposed to do something for foster children, man, maybe even tutoring kids at risk in public school. But, and all of those are great causes. But I came to the conclusion God hasn't given it to me to do everything. And he hasn't given it to you to do everything. But the Spirit of the Lord will guide you. The Spirit of the Lord will, will, will lead you. Not everything that comes down from heaven has our name on it. But there will be certain things that really get your heart. I got a text message from someone in our congregation. That I didn't get his permission, so I won't use his name. But out of the various things that we're doing, he texted me and said, man, that thing in San Luis is really ringing in my spirit. What can I do to make that happen? I mean, so there will be certain things that will just pop out to you whether it be daycare, whether it be prison system, whether it be San Luis, whether it be the work we do with either United Way or Ambulance, whatever, there will be things that will pop out, Hunter's Army, and you say, hey, I want to give to that. I want to be part of that. The Spirit of the Lord will lead you. And this is the one thing I can tell you. When you are following the leading of the Lord, when you trust him in obedience with the possessions that he gives you, you never have to be afraid of irrational generosity. You never have to be afraid of it. You do it cheerfully, without grudgingly. You give and you watch what God does. Second Corinthians 9, 6 through 10 says, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. One of my elders sent me a message last night, uh, uh, Elder Andy, and said, you know, just think about this. Seeds are so cheap, so cheap, but look how much abundance that they put off so cheap. And, and so you must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. That's, that's the Bible. I didn't write this. I know there's some stuff in the Bible y'all think I wrote, but I didn't. It, it, the Lord wrote it. As the scripture says, they're, they're share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity. You, you just can't be God-given. You never have to worry about being an irrational giver and think, man, somewhere down the line, um, uh, this ain't going to work out. No, no, no. Luke 6, 38 says, give and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It will be poured in your lap. For the measure in which you use, it will be measured back to you. And so I'm going to just close this out with a, with a, with a challenge uh, to each of you. And then we're going to pray and we're going to let you go. If you got your legacy cards, I think they'll be at the doors and you can drop those in. But, but, but let, me, let me just say this. It, as as much as we have these projects even on our heart to do into the year, if you're not a tither, I would rather you just start with tithing. Just trust God with that. Trust God with that. Malachi 3.10 says to do that. Trust, test the Lord and see if he won't provide for you. We, we do a 90-day challenge. We do it anytime. We certainly do it at the end of the year. I said it last week. I don't know if I said it in this service. But if you, if you don't tithe and you, and you start tithing for 90 days, a tenth of your income to the household of the Lord. If you're not better off in, 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 in three months, if you're not better off, if you're not at a place where you're finding out, I'm still living the life I'm living and I haven't missed that 10%. If you're not in that position, we'll give you every penny back. Every penny. I've seen God over and over again. He never lies. He's proved himself. You will not miss it when you trust God. 
So if you don't tithe, I, I challenge you, start, uh, start right there. If you're a faithful tither, then remember tithing is, is uh, you, don't wanna, you don't necessarily live by the rule or the law. You just let the Spirit guide you. And, uh, and then that, that final challenge, if you just want to be like Jesus, just be an irrational giver. Just be an irrational giver. Just, just trust the Lord. Can I say something here that's probably, I don't know how to go over, but I'm just going to take a chance on it. I'm already in the red on time, so I got nothing to lose. There's two thoughts I have when I go to a restaurant when it comes to tipping the waitresses. Now, I, I don't quite know what to say about the Starbucks thing where they pop up and ask you for a tip every time and you standing right at the counter. And, they, and if you work at Starbucks, I'm so sorry. I just don't know what to think about that. But you know what I learned? One of the easiest ways to bless people is tipping a waiter or a waitress who served you. It's one of the easiest ways to bless people. I mean, one of the easiest ways. One of the struggles that I have when I go out with people to eat and they want to pay, I got to fight myself from asking them, did you tip them? Because I don't want to be the pastor that everybody in town knows where we've had 10 people eating and the waiter or the waitress has served us and at the end of it collect everything and don't get a tip. I don't want to be the pastor that says, man, that Tyrone Jones came in here with that group. They don't even tip. So if you invite me out, you keep that in mind. <laughs> keep that in mind. But one of the easiest ways to bless people is to tip those who serve you. One of the easiest things to do is to give to God who's given you everything. Why wouldn't you when he's taken care of you and done everything he can for you? Everybody stand if you would. Prayer team, you can come. I'm not really quite sure how to close this, to be honest. Um, did anybody get anything out of what I just said? I mean, did it help you at all? All right, so I'm just going to pray. Those of you that got your legacy cards, they'll collect those at the end. You got till the end of the year, of course. You can always make a year in commitment or give to the end of the year, of course, and help us do what God has called us to do. Be gracious, be generous, be thoughtful. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to be here with your people in the house, and thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity to share the word. I pray that I've done just and right by uh, the message that you've given, and pray that we all embrace it, uh, that we realize that you're generous to us so we can be generous, that you, Lord God, have invested in us so we can trust, we can trust you. Again, be in full trust and full surrender, knowing you are God that will take care of us and your people and you'll be glorified. And Lord, help us as a church. Lord, really our desire here at CTC is not to have a bunch of money in the coffers, but to do what we do, Lord God, faithfully with good stewardship, touching lives of people in our city, in our county, in our state, in our country, and around the world, that they may hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and be brought into places where Christ is exalted. So, Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness. Whatever's going to come in at the end of this year, Lord, I say thank you, Jesus. We'll be wise. We'll be good stewards. And, Lord, I thank you for being gracious to us. And I pray you pour out your blessing upon the people in this house that serve you faithfully and generously. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you. This be an upper room, like the flame we burn Holy, holy, holy Spirit, like a mighty rushing wind, pour your spirit out again. Holy, holy, holy Spirit, let this be.
service. I love how the Word of God can speak to each one of us no matter where we are in our lives and in our relationship with Him. Amen. I just want to give a reminder, if you're looking for a legacy card, they're in the seat backs right in front of you. So if you need to get one of those, go ahead and grab it. And the altars are still open. There are some amazing people up here that are prayed up, ready to pray for you. If you gave your life to Jesus today, you can come and have them pray for you. If you have just anything going on in your life that you just need someone to pray with you, please come up. They are ready and welcoming to pray for you. And the last thing is that at Church for the City, we believe in next steps. So what that means is we don't just give our life to Jesus and that's all we do, right? No matter where we are in our life, in our life and relationship with Jesus, we need to take the next step. So whatever that is for you, if you gave your life to Jesus today, you made the first step, right? And your next step would be baptism. If you need to get baptized or if you just have some questions about getting baptized, please visit the connect table on your way out today. If you want to join a city life group, if you want to join a serve team here at Church for the City, please visit the connect table on your way out. And if you're online today, just click the link for the connect card and somebody will be in contact with you. Thank you for joining us this morning and we will see you next week, same time, same place. Thank you.